from the plan. I'd like to call the um, transportation committee uh, meeting of February 26th. 26th um, um, open and um, we have an agenda before us and I'm substituting for our chair and um, I hope you'll bear with me I'm sure my gavel is a little rusty <laughs> <coughs> so the first item on our agenda is approval of the agenda I'd entertain a motion so moved second moved and seconded and any further discussion all those in favor say aye aye, aye. opposed aye. motion carried we have the minutes of the February 12th meeting before us. Um, if there's any changes, you should let us know now. If not, I'll entertain a motion as well. Motion, Madam Chair. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion carried. The next item on our agenda is employee recognition. And um, we'll go to Mr. Furman um, and for the stack that you have in front of you. You have quite a sizable stack. So I'll, I'll turn the meeting over to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, uh, we always believe it's very important to recognize accomplishment. We have two sets of Metro Transit employees who we would like to recognize before the committee today. Uh, so first off, I'd like to call up uh, Christy Bailey, who will introduce her supervisor and our recognition uh, initially. Christy. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm happy to introduce Mary Johnson. She's a uh, transportation manager at East Metro Garage. Uh, Mary started her career here in 2002 and was promoted to a rail and bus um, supervisor um, from being a bus supervisor and a rail, uh, from a bus operator and rail operator. And then she recently became an assistant transportation manager at East Metro. Madam Chair and Council Members, thank you um, for giving me this opportunity to present my outstanding employee for you today. I'm Assistant Transportation Manager, as, you, as Christy mentioned, at uh, East Metro Garage. On behalf of the Bus Transportation Department at Metro Transit, I'd like to introduce Bus Operator Brad Benner. He did bad. Brad, Mr. Benner has been a bus operator with Metro Transit for the past 24 years. The reason that he's been recognized today is for the commendable actions he performed on Friday, January 26th, at 2018. At approximately 7.50 a.m., Mr. Benner was operating his bus on a Route 63 in the area of Wiper Avenue at East 3rd Street in St. Paul. He noticed a person that appeared to be flagging him down from another Metro Transit bus that was pulled over and stopped at a bus stop. He immediately pulled over and went over to investigate. He discovered that the person was a passenger on the other bus and that the operator of the bus was having a medical emergency. Mr. Benner found the operator passed out on the floor. He quickly attended to her and called TCC for the bus to request medical assistance. He stayed with the operator until other help arrived. This operator is to be commended for his quick thinking and swift reaction to the situation. Uh, so Madam Chair, why don't we give the plaque to uh to Brad right now, and so then uh, you can stay down there and we'll do the second round. All right, very good. So, Madam Chair, we do have a second group of Metro Transit employees we'd like to recognize, and so I'd like to invite David Hansen and uh, Chang Vang up to introduce their employees for their recognition today. So, Madam Chair, Council Members, thank you for allowing me to be here today to introduce to you uh, Chang Yang, um, who is the new uh, manager of street operations. Uh, Chang was uh, promoted right before the heat of the Super Bowl hit. So. <laughs> <laughs> he has many stories to share on that. Um, Jane comes to us with 13 years of uh, transit experience. He was a bus operator, a rail operator. He was a transit supervisor. And then he went into the ranks of the ATM uh, for eight years. Um, when we had that opening to back to my position, of course, I was very excited to see him make it up through the process and to make the selection for the Magic Street option. So with that, Jane Yang. Thank you, Dave. 
Um, so thank you, Madam Chair and Council Members. I'd like to introduce my three trans supervisors. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Again, thank you, Madam Chair and Council Members. Uh, with me today are three trans supervisors who have been nominated for their roles during the Super Bowl 52. First off here is Dan Craig. Uh, Dan put in many hours of preparation time before, during, and after the Super Bowl. He created all the downtown Minneapolis detours for the multitude of Super Bowl events. He worked with internal stakeholders and to ensure that the information was properly communicated to our customers via social media and numerous uh, writer alerts that need to be posted and maintained during the entire time at bus stops. Um, by the way, that Dan was also kind of given the uh, TMP from Minneapolis and it was 152 pages and he studied that and did real well. Uh, Dan was also the lead on, on the street in the downtown Minneapolis during the weeks preceding Super Bowl Sunday, working daily from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m or until he was actually, uh, or later ensuring that the service and customers were being properly directed and connected. On game day, I had the pleasure of also working with Dan. Uh, Dan was the lead for the 60 bus operation for the tailgate party at the convention center. That operation transported approximately 9,000 screen guests into the secured perimeter at the US Bank Stadium within three hours and then back uh, to the convention center post game from the Thriving Pod. Dan Craig is being nominated for this commitment and the many hours of work he performed to ensure a successful event for our regular customers as well as our out of town Super Bowl guests. Next supervisor is Nabil Corey. Uh, Nabil put in many hours of preparation before, during, and uh, after the Super Bowl as well. He was the lead for the U of M detours affected by numerous Super Bowl events. He was also the lead supervisor for the Green Line support and all of the Univer University of Minnesota operations. He updated all the maps and created the training videos for the Green Line bus support. Uh, excuse me. And uh, he was in charge of the airport shuttle routings and post-game support routing from the U.S. Bank Stadium back to the Mall of America, making them available for all our operators uh, on YouTube. During pre-game, protesters had shut down the Green Line uh, LRT to U.S. Bank Stadium. Nabil seamlessly transferred Super Bowl attendants into the Green Line bus support and got them to the game on time and with them not noticing anything really, no big differences at all. Again, he's being nominated for this his commitment and the hours he's put in to make sure that uh, we had a successful event for the regular customers as well as our out of town Super Bowl guests. Last but not least is Bruce Okiso. Bruce put in many hours of preparation before, during, and after the Super Bowl as well. Bruce was our lead supervisor for the Blue Line bus support, as well as the new design coordinating operations for the temporary transit station that was utilized during the Super Bowl week and will be again during the Mall America uh, re total reconstruction later on this year. Bruce worked to ensure that the Blue Line bus support operations being in different location inside the delivery, the delivery of the area of the mall could be conducted efficiently and safely. He relocated bus stops for the operations along the Hiawatha Corridor that need to be relocated outside the secured perimeters, ensuring their availability and that they were properly communicated for our customers. Bruce Otiso is again being nominated for this, uh, for the many hours he's put in and to ensure that it's a successful event for our regular customers as well as our out-of-town support guests. Again, at this time, I would like to formally thank all three of you guys for your work. Uh, it would have been it wouldn't have been a success without all the kids. So thank you. Thank you.
Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, uh, from MTS, I'd like to uh, recognize a couple of people today, too. Um, I want to extend a recognition to Zoe Mullendor and Leslie Kanderis for their support of the Metro Mobility Task Force. Uh, on Wednesday, we, we changed the agenda tonight but so that the full council could hear a report on the task force, and we'll be doing that Wednesday. Uh, but tonight, we recognize their key role in completion of this large document. I recommend not printing it out, uh, reviewing it electronically. Uh, this task force was legislatively established with a very strict deadline of having the report completed by February 15th. Zoe and Leslie helped organize the effort. Um, they managed all the communication with the task force members, uh, secured the membership from each of the required partners, um, coordinated logistics of the meetings, uh, supported Chair Barber and Chair uh, Bingham from Washington County, who is now a state a senator, uh, she changed roles during the uh, task force. Um, when we started the task force, most of the task force members had minimal knowledge of how the service worked, um, its requirements, its challenges. So really coordinating this task force was uh, quite a role that they took on and their effort uh, really produced a successful report. They played roles in compiling all of this work that went into this um, and the recommendations and well, happy to say that the report received unanimous support uh, thanks in part, in part to their effort. We wanna personally thank them from MTS because their work in logistics and coordination allowed us to be able to spend time digging in the details and doing investigations on ideas that task force members came, out, came up with. And so we wanna extend that, that support. Um, we hope that this product will uh, be supported by the legislature. We testify this Wednesday about the results of the task force. We feel that if it's implemented, it will expand and improve Metro Mobility for our customers. We rely on it. And it was really, uh, we really want to extend our thanks to Zoe and Leslie tonight for that effort. Leslie had cautioned that it's legislative season and she may not make it here. Uh, but if you get a chance and you see her, please extend your thanks to her too. So I do know Zoe is here, so mm -hmm. thank you. The next item on our um, agenda is uh, tab is on report, and it's Peter Dugan. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome. Good to see you in that position. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Deputy General Manager Furman and Director Thompson, thank you. Uh, from the Executive Committee, uh, the uh, worth noting is that autonomous vehicles will be placed on uh, you know, informational items going forward. Um, more to come on that. From Min, uh, and then from the me actual tab meeting, MnDOT uh, reported that the Cartas of Commerce got their most, uh, got many, many uh, comments on, on its plan, total of 150 comments, 75 from the Metro. Regarding the VW settlement, which is, all, which is officially called the Beneficiary Mitigation Plan, which is, I took, to, Elaine and I took the liberty of preparing that for you, I uh, hope it's okay, and she deserves the credit, she did it all in the last 10 minutes. Uh, let me just give you a quick highlight. It's mostly on page, uh, pages 8 and 9. The goals in phase 1 are $11.75 million of the $47 million we will get over the 10 years. Uh, the goals are flexible and can be adjusted, but the first phase are school bus replacement, 20% of the funds, which equates to approximately 182 vehicles. Second, heavy duty on the road vehicles such as transit buses, class four to eight, that's medium to heavy duty trucks, that will take 35% of the budget and 137 vehicles. Heavy duty off the road, which encompasses mostly diesel, but can, uh, almost all diesel, uh, yeah. port handling vessel, uh, port handling machinery, okay. uh, uh, locomotives, tugs, will get 15% and 13 vehicles. Heavy duty electric vehicle programs, and again, this will be transit and the like, but also in includes air, pol air, 
airport ground support, 15%, 26 vehicles, and electrical ve electric vehicle charging stations are 15% of the funds and 63. Now, I want to make a correction on what I said to you, honorable members, the last time, and I think uh, uh, Councilmember Dorfman gave me the eye. Go, I don't think that's right. But anyway, so thank you, Councilmember. <laughs> yeah, you were right on top of it. <coughs> the, the main charging station would be for 150 kilowatts, which gives an 8.7 miles per minute charge, and that costs about 100 to 150,000. And then if, you, if one were to get up into the, uh, the higher ones, which is, you know, 350 kilowatts, they go up to, you know, 150 and up. So it's, it, and the uh, thought right now uh, from the commissioner of the MPCA that was there is they're working on a geographic distribution, primary corridors, rest stops, public location workplaces, and multi-unit. Uh, also, uh, there was in, there's a context that I'd like to share with you about disproportionately affected by air pollution areas. Mm -hmm. And what studies have shown is that uh, areas where there's reduced and free lunches often have a higher in index of air pollution. And so 20% of the funds will be allocated towards uh, that situation in the Twin Cities and 20% of the funds towards greater Minnesota. In terms of the perspective uh, or, or the, uh, the distribution of funds across the, across the uh, state, because 60% of the violating vehicles were in, in the Twin Cities, the Twin Cities, will get, Twin Cities area will get 60% of the funds, 40% for outstate Minnesota. And um, I, I see Council Member McCarthy making, making a note, and so if I can, uh, if I can just, uh, if I can just have your indulgence for a moment. Uh, where was that? I will. The, um, if you look at the bottom of, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt uh, members, but the bottom of page 13 and then page 14, and that is where the, uh, the, the uh, information about the exposure uh, of uh, folks in more uh, poverty areas to higher pollution. And then that was translated into uh, <coughs> sc uh, school free or reduced lunch, you know, for the school buses. That's where that, that nexus came from. And public comment on the, the, benef the beneficiary mitigation settlement ends March 19th. From the MAC, Sun Country is going ultra uh, low cost. That means it's outsourcing its ground services, but efforts we are told are being made to have the, you know, refer the employees to the new uh, ground services. Construction restarts at the airport after a Super Bowl interlude on March the 1st. Hotel schedule still scheduled for July the 1st. And JetBlue starts one destination service or destination, I'm sorry, service to one destination on May 18th. On the action items, uh, two items that will come to you on March the 12th, but in talking with Elaine, I thought it'd be best to give you a heads up and perhaps Joe Barbeau will, uh, will certainly amplify what I have to say, but there will be scope changes, your consideration of scope changes for the 6th Street overhead signals and the University of Minnesota protected bikeways. Uh, what is key here is that uh, Chair Hovland has noted that how are we going to evaluate scope changes? Is it going to be based on principles of what is a scope change? Is it the dollars involved? Is it a kind for kind or substitution? Is it true to the project? But in that regard, a task force has been uh, commissioned by the TAC, the tra uh, Transportation, uh, the Technical Advisory Committee to look at this. And the word de minimis, which as you know all means small or small amounts of money, is now added to the tab lexicon. That was a, probably the biggest thing to come from that. Uh, <laughs> and then a, an item that you will not see is the, or you may see in March the 12th, is a, is a request for a program extension for the Washington Technical Safe Routes to School. Um, as you know, a ex project extension is limited to one time. And there is a risk that uh, although the funding is guaranteed, they do go to the back of the line. And again, Joe will correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the timing may not be perfect. So they may do the project and then get paid. And the last item that was brought up, it's, again, you will see, and Chair Hovland recalls this uh, again, it calls this tab light, another new item for our, another new name for our lexicon. It only, we only refer, the tab only refers it to 
uh, the Met Council, and that is the Air Lake 2035 Long-Term Comprehensive Plan, and that will be coming uh, up to you. I have any questions? And when I'm also, uh, Jenna also took, I asked Jenna to take the liberty of distributing to you what constitutes the uh, uh, streamlined process in a TIP amendment. Um, a little cheesy, I keep near and dear to my heart. So. <laughs> Thank you, members. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Any questions? Uh, on a personal note, I have to let you know that I really appreciate your reports. Thank you, Madam. Um, uh, I, it's, it's very evident that you're engaged and, um, and that you're very, your reports are clear and concise, and I appreciate uh, your participation in this Thank committee. Thank you. Most appreciated. The next item on our agenda are division reports, and the first is from our Transportation Services Director. Uh, Madam Chair, members, uh, a couple of brief updates. Uh, progress continues on the TPP. Uh, prior to our next Transportation Committee, we'll really have begun the process of getting recommendations through the uh, TAC subcommittees and TAC for releasing the draft TPP to the public. So this starts uh, on March 8th with the TAC Planning Subcommittee. And by the and through in ends in June when we bring it to the transportation committee and then full council for approval to release the draft for public comment. So it's beginning uh, on schedule that we've uh, talked about previously. The other thing that has started is the legislative session. Uh, we have multiple hearings this week. That if you uh, notice the schedules, we have hearings on our budget. Uh, Metro Mobility Task Force, which I mentioned, is presented OLA audit, and I'm sure there's some other ones that have been added uh, this today yet, too. So uh, they are uh, a lot of hearings beginning this week. Uh, Quarters of Commerce, we have uh, received the official list of projects that are to be scored for the metro area. Uh, we received that last Friday from MnDOT, and we're just beginning to go through that. It looks like 76 projects will be evaluated and uh, we'll have to make a decision uh, with, whether to support those projects. That's about as far as I could get now. It's a, it's a long list. Some of the projects are ones we don't even understand necessarily what they are. So um, because they could be submitted by anybody and the general public did submit projects, um, some of them are not necessarily clear what they are. So more to come on that. Uh, but we're beginning that by receiving the list of projects from MINDA last week. That starts a 60-day clock for uh, the count MPOs. Uh, here and around the state to s offer letters of support for projects or not. They are hoping to announce the final projects uh, before the end of April, though. Lastly, uh, in December, Council took action on the um, MVES pol or the policy with suburban transit providers for distribution of funding. Uh, with that policy, we had to develop procedures and, and finalize. We, the process was moving to a block grant system where we uh, establish a distribution percentage for each of the four suburban providers, and um, and then that would not change. Uh, what would change is, depending on how much money was available, we distribute based on the same percentage. We had been working through some final budget numbers with uh, one of the providers, and that has now been completed. The last Friday, we dis we sent out to the, the directors uh, and each of the four suburban providers the final allocation percentages. So they have that, um, and they're probably still reviewing it. But the, now the, the final step, which is a procedural, is just to get an agreement, a very brief agreement about those percentages. But policy is now in place. So suburban transit providers now know how much they'll receive for 2018 and what going forward that their percentages will be. Uh, so that kind of wraps that process up, we hope. So that is good progress. And with that, Madam Chair, that concludes my report. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions? If not, then we'll move to the uh, Transit General, Metro Transit General Manager report. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, Ryan is unable to be here today, so I'll give a couple update items from the General Manager's office. Uh, first off is it's time this year for the Commuter Choice Awards coming up. And so we invite council members to uh, send in nominations for the upcoming Commuter Choice Awards coming up here in April. Uh, those nominations are due to us by March 7th. Now, those are to recognize and celebrate individuals, organizations, businesses that are advancing sustainable transportation in the region. There are six award categories that you may choose to nominate for uh, from 
entities that you know of who've done great things, and they include employer and government entity of the year. Uh, the awards actually will be presented at a luncheon on Thursday, April 26, and we'll send out details on that. Certainly any of you are invited to attend that celebration. Uh, second, we have our annual police awards coming up. And so we do extend that invitation to council members to celebrate the Metro Transit Police at the department's annual award ceremony. The awards will be held at the Midpoint Event Center in St. Paul at 2.30 on Wednesday, March 21st. Officers will be recognized for their extraordinary efforts. And the department will also use the event to name and recognize their Officer of the Year, which is always a very big event for us. Third, uh, we are recognizing our drivers. And so the last couple of years, uh, the American Public Transit Agency and ourselves at Metro Transit uh, will be joining transit agencies around the country in celebrating operators for Transit Driver Appreciation Day. Meals will be provided at each of our garages and light rail facilities on Thursday, March 15. We'll also be encouraging staff and customers to write commendation and, and share thank you cards with their operators. Uh, those thank you cards, if you all have a, a situation that you want to send out a thank you or a commendation, can be downloaded from our website, uh, metrotransit.org backslash transit hyphen driver hyphen day. And we'll send out details to you. That's a lot to remember uh, on that point. And then fourth and final, Madam Chair, uh, we are on the, the cusp of March, which means that St. Patrick's Day is coming up soon. <laughs> so we're going to extend our annual partnership with Miller Coors and teaming up with them to offer free rides on Metro Transit routes from 6 p.m. until 3 a.m. on St. Patty's Day. This year, it's a Saturday into Sunday morning, so some folks might be out about and about. Uh, last year, we were able in this partnership with Miller Coors to offer 53,000 free rides. Uh, so Miller Coors underwrites the cost of all these free rides, so it's no uh, revenue loss to Metro Transit and it's been a, a long time, very successful partnership with them. That concludes my report. All right, thank you. Any questions? All right, thank you. The next item on the agenda are three consent items. Uh, if there are no objections from committee members, if you wish to move one of those to a business item or a non-consent item, now would be the time. If not, I'll entertain a motion to um, pass the three consent items on the agenda. Make a motion to pass all three on the agenda, Madam Chair. Thank you. Moved. Second. Seconded. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. <clears throat> Excuse me. Madam but, Chair, yes. may I interrupt for a second? I, uh, in response to Councilmember McCarthy, uh, uh, page 24 of the, um, I'm sorry, of, of the VW settlement also talks about the disproportionate impact. However, I've yet to find the uh, a, a Honestly, a connection where it goes to the free and reduced lunch program that was comment made by one of the tab members, but it would seem to be logical. Uh, and it also comes up under uh, comments on environmental uh, environmental equity. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Oh, you're welcome. So the two items on the non-consent items, the first item is 2018-45. We have Mr. Alexander who will give the presentation on that issue. Welcome to the Madam committee. Chair, good afternoon. I'm Jim Alexander, project director of the Southwest LRT project, and I uh, have an item 2018-45. Uh, it re it uh, has to do with uh, our appraisal services uh, related to condemnation. And uh, so, to give you a little background, we have 153 private parcels we're looking to acquire property, whether it's temporary construction easement. A partial acquisition or full acquisition and uh, we typically uh, do uh, do an offer for for all these parcels and uh, if that offer is not uh, we don't reach our agreement uh, with the property owner then uh, then it goes to condemnation there's also if a personal a particular property has uh, has uh, some kind of uh, easement tied to it that needs to get uh, cleaned up uh, that would also be a reason to take it into condemnation and so this is a, uh, a business item to uh, to uh, seek approval for the uh, regional administrator to negotiate and execute uh, uh, three contracts. And uh, it really comes back uh, back to December 2017, where we issued an RFP for this uh, a master contract seeking uh, three to five uh, 
uh, consultants to help us with these services. And uh, there was an evaluation panel that, uh, that looked at nine proposals and uh, landed on uh, these three Integra Re Real Realty Resources, Patchkin, Messner, Dodd, and Brum, and RLS Valuation Services as being most advantageous to the council. So uh, Madam Chair, committee members, I present to you uh, this is item 2018-45, seeking approval for this item. Thank you. Any questions from committee members? No? I'll entertain a motion then. So, so moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion carried. saying it shouldn't be consent. No. Oh. I wonder uh, um, what a staff uh, is suggesting that maybe it could go consent to council, this item that we just passed. I don't know how you folks feel about that. Yeah. You think it's okay? All right. I can go to consent. The next item is 2018-37. This is the same week item, and we have Ms. White. Welcome to the committee. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair and members. My name is Katie White. I'm a senior planner at MTS. The action in front of you today is a UPWP amendment for the 2018 UPWP. As a brief refresher, on an annual basis, we submit the Unified Planning Work Program to MnDOT as a grant application for federal plan transportation planning funds for use in the Twin Cities metropolitan area. Uh, this document is created you know, seven to eight months in advance of the calendar year, so sometimes things arise that we don't foresee. Uh, we uh, became clear a couple of months ago that it's a priority for 2018 for both the council and also MnDOT to put in a system-to-system -system interchange study and get that spending underway in 2018 instead of 2019. And so we're requesting a UPWP amendment to uh, get that contract let as soon as possible. This is especially important for our MnDOT partners who have uh, certain requirements attached to the funds that they plan on spending for this project. Uh, this is a streamlined uh, UPWP amendment from the TAC and TAP process, which means it skips TAC planning and TAC. You know, there was an action taken by TAC exec, and it went to TAB actually just last week where it was uh, voted for approval. Um, we are requesting same week action today so that MnDOT can let the contract as soon as possible um, to, so that they can start their spending as soon as possible. I'm happy to take any questions, Chair. Mm -hmm. Questions from committee mem members? I have one. The system-to-system -system interchange study. Um, which systems? Put, put it, Chair, put it in lay, layperson's uh, level here. I'll defer to our director, Nick Thompson. Madam Chair, uh, this is, uh, I guess, our internal code for free or two freeways done together, those type of interchanges. So major freeway to freeway interchanges, we believe there's about 50 to 52 of them that would qualify. Um, Example would be 35W and 494 is a common one that comes up as a system to system that we would study. Um, these were almost in every case be two state highways coming together, or interstate and state highway. Um, I don't believe there's any county road in, in state highway intersections, so okay. we, uh, MnDOT level roads. That was helpful. Thank you. I'll entertain a motion on this item then. So Moved. Second. A second. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. And that is the same week item. Next item, uh, we are in our information portion of our agenda, and it's the TAP update. And Mary, I don't know if I can pronounce your name correctly. I will try. Capistran. Is that close? Pretty close. Capistrant. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to the committee. Madam Chair, Council Members, I'm really happy to be here today. Um, it's been a, just over a quarter um, of uh, four months that the TAP program has been um, running, and uh, it's very exciting to um, share with you some of the stories we've heard as well as some of the staff. So uh, um, here we go. 
So this slide here will um, is a representation of what growth has looked like on the TAP program. Um, the, the unique rides, um, as you can see, that those are unique riders, so individual people that are riding, and you can see the very steep curve on that. Um, uh, unique riders are, well, you can see you have information all the way through January there. Um, in February, we had about just over 23,000 riders. Um, so we, we are growing very well and very steep um, in this. And this is with folks finding out about the program, people um, getting um, on board. Um, our average rides for the amount of people that are traveling in about 32 rides per month for the TAP users. Let me comparison that to uh, Metro Pass riders are riding uh, about 29 times. Uh, U Pass riders 25 times a month. Um, the only people that surpass that would be the college pass and the student pass programs that run 35 to 33 times a month. So the TAP, the people that are on the TAP program are very happy to have it and they're using it often. Um, the uh, information on the, the other side is the total rides. Again, um, we're, we're top over a hundred and uh, I forgot, I'm sorry, I forgot the stats. But when we set out to do this program, what we wanted to do is, is get about um, 20 to 10 to 20,000 people enrolled in the program in the first year. We're well on our way to get that um, 10,000 people as we watch this grow um, month over month. It's gaining traction. Um, we have saved our riders um, about $130,000 thus far. And those are the people that we heard in the, the public hearings that really needed it the most. So we're really pleased that we can offer them type, that type of discount. This is a representation of where they're, when they're riding. Um, the blue is the urban local routes. Um, as we know of Metro Transit, we have been, that ridership has been declining and gathering more and more TAP people. The people are riding more often. Um, we know that and uh, this is when they're riding. It, it very similarly mirrors the pilot programs that we did. So we're really excited about that. Um, we have the capacity on those routes. So um, they're not overwhelming. You can see in the, the black and the red, those are express bus riders. So they, we, we are um, thrilled with the results. Again, it's similar to the pilot. Uh, where are they riding? This is the, the Twin Cities area map. Um, you know, obviously very, the green line is very popular. Um, you can look through those. The most popular routes, of course, the 5, the 21, 19, 64, 22. Um, what's impacting this uh, ridership? You see some, we do have some holes, is that we only, we have four open enrollment sites, one in downtown St. Paul, one in downtown Minneapolis. Um, Southwest Transit Station is an enrollment site, and so we have a partner in Shaka that's helping us pass out the cards to the general public. So anybody can go with a, a EBT card or a reduced free lunch certification letter um, and several others, a housing authority, St. Paul Public Housing letter, and you can enroll in a TAP program on site, add funds, and, and you're riding right away. Um, so we have had a, a lot of success with those, but we do have limited sites that are happy to be an open enrollment site. We have about another 30, uh, by, um, we, we have about another, we have many users that are um, interested in partnering with us and uh, I'll get to that in a minute. So um, what is the impact? Um, this is Stuart. Um, we interviewed Stuart. He says he loves the program. Um, he, as, as you read through there, he, uh, um, he, got, he got rid of his car at some point and uh, he was able to, he still does odd jobs. So he has taken lumber on our buses, short pieces, he tells us, um, <laughs> as to not interfere, but it, it, that as well as some of his paint gear, so he can still get around. He no longer has a car and he's transit dependent, but he's still able to do all those things that you know he did when he had a car and he's very thrilled about it. Um, you know, it's also a social thing for him. Stuart's uh, wife died a few years ago and his 18 year old son is gonna be moving out and so he knows when he gets out there on the buses that, that he's not alone and it, it becomes a social event for him as well. And then finally, you know, he tells us that, you know, it allows him to do everything he's been able, he wants to do. And now he has that little bit of extra money so that he can travel when he wants. Um, we interviewed another young lady just last Friday, Benita. Uh, she's a single mom. 
She used to live in Brooklyn Park and with the TAP card, she was able to move out to St. Louis Park um, where she really wanted to live. Because um, she says, now I can afford to get out of the inner city and that's where she wants to raise her child. Um, she said, I could probably not be able to go to work every day without the blessing of a TAP card. So, you know, we're, we're really affecting the people um, that live in the Twin Cities that have the least ability to pay. Um, this is what we've heard from the Director of Housing um, at the House of Charity in downtown Minneapolis. And he came up with three specific points when he summarized what he's been hearing. And that's, you know, people can maintain their ability to keep friendships and, and family relations because now they can get to where they need to go. They are able to you know, look for their jobs and be, feel confident that they can get to their jobs with the TAP program because it only now costs them a dollar. And then finally, the, the ability to afford those little things, the over-the-counter medications um, that otherwise they, they had to put it into bus fare and they didn't have. So we, we love talking to the people that are um, using the TAP card and uh, hear these stories. So we, there are many, many more to come. But I thought I'd just share a couple that we had. Now these, now I get to the community partners. This is a list of the community partners that we're working with now. These people have said, yeah, I'm, I wanna be a part of the TAP program. I wanna help people get the TAP card and get riding. Um, the, the, the biggest, of course, have easily coming on board were the housing authorities, Minneapolis Public Housing, both their um, HRA and their Section 8, our own HRA, um, St. Paul Public Housing, so um, we also are Common Bond Communities, which is a very large organization in the Twin Cities. They're passing the cards out for us. Um, so we have a lot of those. We have um, Simpson Housing. We just this last week brought on the community card, which is uh, the card that gets you into the shelter. Those organizations signed up with us, but they're going to send the people to us so that we can enroll them. Um, we also have some partners like the Energy Assistance program here in the state of Minnesota. If you get a, or approved for energy assistance, that certification will give you access to the TAP program because it does meet our income qualifications of 185% of the poverty or 50% of the AMI. We've come across some unlikely partners. I met with Ramsey County Corrections about a week and a half ago. Um, they're also looking at the, the benefit it will do their folks who are on parole or those people who are have been incarcerated that they can start riding, they can make the appointments, they can do the things they need to do. So um, in, including the boys in Totem Town. Um, so we're working on getting them on board. The hardest part for the community partners is trying to figure out how to fit TAP into their infrastructure that they have already. So that's, we've had, I consider slow growth in partners, but we, we are retooling our website to make it easier to understand. Once I sit down and meet with them, everyone wants to be on board. It's just the nut of figuring out how to income certify the people that they support and be able to document that for fraud control. So the next steps in, in the TAP program, um, we're engaging more and more of um, the operators. You know, These are the cards that the operators can pass out to people on the street when they believe that maybe somebody needs a little help paying their fare. Um, it's a very simple tool. Um, we also have, uh, um, we're looking at the equity lens tool. We have a tool at Metro Transit that helps to make sure that we're not missing segments of our population that we really should be looking at. We're, I'm working with the um, EAC. I'll be meeting with them as well so that we can sit and talk about what does equity look like in the Twin Cities and how this TAP program can help. We are um, rewriting our website, as I mentioned. Um, we get more and more information all the time saying, well, this was confusing, this makes sense, or can you give me a poster or can you do this? So in the short period of time, we've been refining the program, working with the marketing department to produce the materials that our, our partners are asking for so that we can enroll more and more folks. Um, we are doing some targeted reach out, outreaches to the agencies. We already have partnerships. Um, we haven't done that yet, but we are about to reach out. We really wanted to make sure the pro program message was succinct and ready to go. Formal um, 
partnerships um, with agencies for feedback. We're working on that. Fraud controls, we're still ratcheting that down to make sure that we can really show folks that we were careful. Only people who qualify are getting the, are getting the card, and we will continue to do that. As you know, in June, we need to come back to you again with, and find out how we could possibly maybe make the, the safety net a little bit wider and invite more folks, but that's what we're working for. Any questions? Question. Oh, my goodness. Where should we start? Let's start with the uh, council member McCarthy and we'll move up the road. Well, I, I just have a, a simple question. Yes, I noticed you have Malax Band of Ojibwe there. Do we have services that go all the way up there or is it just for their members internally here in um, the cities? Could you read where? Malax Band, Malax Band of Ojibwe yeah. is one of the partners. And I was just wondering if we have any services that go all the way up to that area, or is that just for their members who live in the metro area? We we allow them to distribute the cards to those folks that can use it. Just go. I don't believe we have services that far up north, but a lot of the people are in the Twin Cities. We've made a concerted effort to reach out to the American Indian community so that they are involved. Um, we do a lot of sales with them as well from the revenue side. So. Council Member Reynoso, trying to move up the move up the line here. Are you going this way? Yeah, yeah. I saw your hand there. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mary, thank you for doing this. Uh, you know, I think you're doing a fantastic job. As you know, I'm a huge supporter of this, of the TAP program, and uh, as the chair of the EAC, welcome you back and to have some more conversation and and ideas. Uh, I do have a couple questions <clears throat> as far as. Uh, I, I noticed a couple high schools in here. How does how does that work? Because I know we have agreements with school districts, but individual high schools, what exactly would that be for? Well, the individual, Madam Chair, Council Member, the individual high schools came to me and said, all my students qualify. And if for, when they all get reduced free lunch at my school. How can I help them get there? Uh, how can, um, I believe, North St. Paul, and we don't have a partnership. They are not on the student pass program. So this is a way to get their students to and from. We know how successful the, the student pass program has been, but this gave the uh, principal of that school the option to make sure these kids can get to and from school. Um, you know, if their parents can't drive them, for those who that have service, they're, they're using it and they're very happy about it. Council Member Reynoso. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I get that. I, I understand that, but I, I don't believe that was the intention of it to use it for schools because, quite frankly, uh, school districts are the ones that pay for it when we partner with them. They pay a discounted rate for their students to be, be able to take the system, but I don't think the intention was for schools to circumvent our regular school system that we have. So I'm, I'm a little concerned about that. So Okay. I will take that back as I know. Excellent. Councilmember uh, Dorfman. Madam Chair, thank you. So I just want to thank you, Mary. So for people who don't know, for people who are homeless and using the shelters, um, they get a community card because they often don't have um, the kind of identification that would have let them register for this program. And so the fact that you're accepting that community card is really, really great. And so even though all of the shelter agencies in Minneapolis are now participating. We're not all on this list yet because we all work together. And so once we heard that, we're all putting up the posters about the TAP program and handing things out. So, um, and, the, and then there's no question we were talking about how could it even be better? And so something to think about, well, when people go and register, if there was a little bit of incentive with a little bit of money, um, you know, $5 or less even, $2, uh, well, two dollars probably is enough to, as an incentive to go get a tap card. Um, then we think even more of uh, the folks we're serving would take advantage of it. Thank you, Councilmember Litovsky. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, you had mentioned, Mary, that um, more people are taking more rides. That some of the tap members are, are using the buses more and during off peak, which is when we have capacity, which is great. I'm wondering if you can. Uh, quantify that at all? How or how we know? 
Well, we, we run the, anal Madam Chair, we run the uh, analysis on, on how we track all these products because we can, we know how many rides they're taking, how often in their unique ridership. So we've been tracking this on a monthly basis um, to see. It's very similar to our pilot. Um, we know how many times a Metro Pass person uses theirs on an average month, and that's the trends that are going. And they've been really stable over the last, you know, eight years, you know, people are riding consistently. So TAP, we're comparing that against TAP so that we can see really what's what's the benefit and how that ridership is working for us. So you can't track a person so much as you can track that there's but, more but, people using the, or people using the TAP card are taking more rides than the average. That is, is that correct. Way okay. The the TAP product is, is an actual product, so whenever the, um, the analysis picks up that a tap card was used and it paid a dollar. We're able to track those rides in aggregate. We don't track them specifically, but we can do that with most of our products, and that's how we can compare them. Oh, okay. So soon when we hear the ridership update, maybe at some point we'll see a peak. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions, There's comments? Council Member Elkins. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just just a comment. I was talking with Lisa Horn out at Veep a couple of months ago, and they're one of our agencies. And she was telling me just how it helps them connect people with jobs. We've got a lot of clients that uh, work at fast food restaurants in uh, Bloomington and, and Richfield, and uh, this has you know made it a lot easier for some of those people just to keep and hold jobs to have transportation to be able to get to those places. Madam Chair, Council Member, I'm glad you brought that up. Veep has, has been a good partner with us, but a lot of the partners have come to us and says, I wish you could come out and help us. The, the enrollment sites that we did during the pilot, we had, we had about 18 different enrollment sites, and that allowed us to be where the individuals are. Um, right now, the program was designed around as little administration as we could do, but uh, we are looking and exploring what that might look like so that we can more fully support those areas in the community that we haven't been able to get a partner with yet, as well as support the partners that we do have when they have an, an open house or some type of an event, we can be there and rolling and uh, taking the burden off of them, shifting it to us just a little to get them involved and get them on board. And thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and just to follow up on the question from um, Councilmember Renoso, I think what the question to go back to the schools is maybe to go, uh, go query the schools and find out what the students are using the passes for. Because if they're using it to go to jobs or to go to other activities, that's exactly what we want them to be using it for. And so I think maybe that's the kind of question to go find out and maybe bring back the next report. We can do that. Research, right. yes. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments from committee members? I see Mr. Petrie would like to address us. Yeah, well, sure, committee members. Uh, one thing I'd like to add is a little, a little more information on the cards. The cards that they're actually using is a Gorsuch card. So one thing with the Gorsuch card, we're able, when they take it, we're able, we know what fare set they're riding at, we know where and what fare set. So that is just telling us that that's the way we can track it. If it's an express ride or some local, urban local, what the Gorsuch is using. So to answer your question, that's how we know 60% of it is You had another question? Madam Chair. Council Member McCarthy. Madam Chair, I'm just curious. Um, do you have an approximate um, amount that you think this will cost by the end of the year and like within the next two years? Madam Chair, Council Member, we, we, our original estimates were between two and uh, three million dollars a year. Um, we are currently running under that. Um, we were hoping for a fully mature product and, and a couple years down the road, it could reach about $4 million a year. But that's right now we are running below estimates if we were to forecast it forward. Good, good questions. Committee satisfied so far and no, no further questions? No, well, thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Uh, the next item uh, is the annual park and ride survey results. And we have uh, Ms. Lintoff and Choi. Welcome to the committee. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Council Members. My name is Anna Flintoff, and I am the manager of planning and urban design in Metro Transit's engineering and facilities department. 
I'm joined by Subin Choi, who has been our intern this year. Subin is a student at McAllister College. She's a senior, and she's been majoring in geography and studio art. And so has been bringing us a lot of good uh, GIS skills and graphic design skills. So we are here to report on the annual Park mm -hmm. Ride System Survey. This is an annual effort that we partner with other suburban transit providers and MnDOT Wisconsin Department of Transportation and counties to count uh, vehicle and bicycle usage at 106 park and rides and 42 park and pool facilities. So park and pools are places where only carpooling takes place. Park and ride facilities are locations that have transit service. And we want to thank our partners for their efforts in helping us conduct this survey every year. Um, today we're going to focus just on the 106 park and ride facilities. So within this system, there are over 34,000 parking spaces. Uh, these facilities primarily serve express bus service going to downtown Minneapolis and downtown St. Paul, University of Minnesota. There are also park and rides on North Star and two Blue Line stations. And as you can see from this map and the table here, Metro Transit is the largest uh, provider of park and rides with 73 facilities. And then other um, providers have um, service as well. MBTA has 15 facilities, Southwest has seven, Maple Grove has five, Plymouth has four, and the <coughs> North Star Link service serves two park and rides. So we use this information to help us plan park and rides and make decisions about expansion needs, um, opportunities to close or consolidate facilities and to adjust service levels. And effective management of the park and ride system is important for achieving several thrive outcomes. It supports stewardship of both the highway system and the transit system by moving more people through congested highway corridors. And it supports livability and prosperity outcomes in suburban communities by offering transportation uh, choices to key employment centers. So I'm going to turn it over to Subin now to talk about the process of collecting the data and what we learned. Thank you, Anna. Madam Chair, committee members. Um, this year, we impl implemented a new surveying method for around half of our park and ride facilities by incorporating the use of iPhones and an app called Device Magic. Where we uh, previously collected and organized <coughs> park and ride data uh, more manually, this new me method saved staff time and also improved both the quality and kinds of data collected. For example, we were able to gather <coughs> photographs of current amenities, such as shelters, bus stops, real-time signs, and bike parking. Um, for 40 park and ride facilities, 11 transit centers serving bike and ride customers, and at all A-Line, Green Line, and Blue Line stations. This method wasn't um, implemented for facilities surveyed by our uh, suburban transit provider partners, but we hope that we can expand this method through all of our uh, facilities in the future. So now I will move on to some of the findings from this year's survey. Um, this graph shows the annual parking ride usage from 2004 to 2017. The bars show the system capacity for each year where the blue indicates the utilized spaces and red indicates the available spaces. And the gray line shows a percent utilization um, of spaces each year. Between 2004 and 2008, there was relatively high rate of growth in uh, total capacity and utilization. Um, and between 2008 and 2017, percent utilization lowered and maintains a relatively flat curve with usage hovering between 18,000 and 19,000 users. Around 19,600 spaces out of 34,000 total spaces where 58% of total capacity was observed to be utilized in 2017. So every year we have park and ride facility expansions and closures that affect the system capacity. This year there was a minor decline of 164 spaces in our system, mostly due to four facility closures. This map highlights additions of new spaces in yellow closures in red and capacity corrections in blue at existing facilities. And you can see that one facility was added to our system, four facilities closed, and three were corrected due to reconfigurations and construction projects in 2017. In 2017, we added Carmike Cinema to the system capacity. 
It's an overflow lot that has been open for a few years, but was previously not included in the survey. Um, it was added to the MVTA system to serve as an overflow lot for Apple Valley Transit Station. Walnut Street and Chaska Boulevard <clears throat> in Clover Fields, operated by Southwest Transit, closed due to low utilization. And East Bethel Theater and Family of Christ Lutheran Church closed after a three-year demonstration period. They were leased by Anoka County to support limited trips on Route 865, but closed as performance on these trips didn't warrant continued service. Egan Transit Station's capacity was corrected to remove around 90 spaces, which were served for um, retail parking purposes, and several other facilities' capacities were corrected given recent construction projects and data validation. Overall, the usage of park and ride facilities increased by around 900. <coughs> there was a 4% increase, or an increase of 135 users for park and ride facilities serving the North Star, which is largely due to increase in North Star ridership between 2016 and 2017. There was a 29% overall increase in usage of facilities serving the Blue Line, but much of these uh, increases were attributed to a temporary, temporary lease of spaces in 28th Ave Station, which resulted in an increase of 531 users. Um, otherwise, Blue Line usage was fairly flat and uh, pretty consistent among previous years. There was also an increase in usage of facilities on the express bus routes, mainly in Burnsville and Maple Grove. Staff members at Bur Burnsville reported that addition of Route 495 has likely increased usage at Burnsville Transit Station, which saw an increase of 307 users this year. And in Maple Grove, 93 more users were observed in Maple Grove Transit Station, and 66 more users were observed in Maple Grove Parkway compared to last year. An agency staff informed that the increase was likely due to the relocation of Sleep Comfort um, and Select Comfort and Fleet Numbers headquarters from Plymouth to Minneapolis. Mm. <coughs> Overall, we observed about 58% of our total capacity um, to have been utilized in 2017, but there are certainly facilities with usage rates, rates that are closer to capacity and those with lower usage rates. This map highlights facilities that were constrained and facilities with low usage rates. The ones in blue have over 50% of spaces available and the facilities shown in red have constrained spaces um, where over 90% of parking spaces were utilized. Um, in 2017, there were 14 facilities that were close to capacity at the time of the survey and six of them have capacity of over 100 spaces. Overall, we can observe that there are more available facilities than there are constrained. <coughs> this map visualizes the distribution of individual park and rides, uh, but if we group the usage and capacity facilities by transit corridors that they serve, um, we can take a, take a look at this map. Here we can see that each transit corridor um, is a wedge surrounding the 7th County metro area. Each wedge shows the transit corridor that funnels people in towards the metro region and the usage and capacity have been grouped for each corridor on a pie chart, um, and the size of each pie chart is proportional to the total capacity at each corridor. <coughs> this map shows that all of the corridors on major highways have available parking spaces provided by our regional park and ride facilities. And in 2017, <coughs> the, two, the two most constrained corridors um, were I-35 West South Lower with 79% utilization and I-94 East with 78% utilization. Now I will pass it back to Anna. We'll talk about next steps. Any questions from committee members so far? <laughs> Council Member McCarthy. I have a question, Madam Chair. Um, the one in East Bethel and the Family of Christ Lutheran Church, I, I didn't quite understand. Is that the, did that close due to, was that the one, the route that had a, that was a pilot program? And then you ended that route? Okay. So what do we do with that after these, after we close these facilities? What do we specifically do with these locations? Um, Madam Chair, Council Member, those locations were um, leased by Anoka County. 
So they were not permanent facilities, they were <coughs> temporary leases. Okay, any other questions? Councilmember Dorfman. Madam Chair, thank you. So do we have any sense of, if we look at our um, system capacity and overall percent use, how it compares to other comparable systems in the country? I don't know if we should feel, boy, we're, we're trending right, this is great, or we could be doing a whole lot better. Yeah, Madam Chair, Council Member, I don't know the answer to that. That's a really good question that would, would be useful. I think that um, our park and ride trends um, kind of mimic uh, bus ridership overall. Yeah. So that yeah. is part of the, the trend that we're seeing, but we, but we do have a large park and ride system. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks. Nick? Yeah, Madam Chair, maybe when we, when we talk about the ridership data, you'll see the trends, and I think it's easier for us to compare ridership with peers than it maybe would be with park and rides. So um, that's a, a good way to compare. Council Member Elkins. Yeah, my, my impression is we have one of the larger park and ride systems in the country, don't we? No. No? I don't know. Yeah, Madam Chair, Council Members, I don't know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. I, I think that is true, but that is something that would be useful information to have. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, is there an optimal number that we're trying to target for capacity like to know that you've built enough and not too much and yeah. that type of thing uh, madam chair council members um, i don't know that there is an optimal capacity i think we have built for um, future demand and and demand has not grown as quickly as we had previously anticipated so we do have capacity for for future growth so that is an opportunity that we we have in our system okay thanks council member Reb um, McCarthy. What's Madam on? Chair. Um, in regards to the I-35W um, location, is that the one on 95th, on 95th Avenue? The one that you said is 79% utilization? Uh, Madam Chair, Council Member, I think Subin was talking about um, when we group all of, sometimes we group facilities within a given quarter to kind of look at a collection of facilities. And so that is, um, that is part of, that does include, um, not 95th, this is 35W South, mm -hmm. um, which would include facilities like 35W and Kenrick um, Avenue. Okay. So those those facilities, it also includes Burnsville Transit Station, which you saw did have an increase in use this year. So that's part of what is, is driving that higher use in that area. And then, so do you also take into consideration for example, the 95th, the um, for 95th Avenue one. Do you take in consideration, like this year or last year, we used that facility for the state fair? Do you take those numbers in consideration too? To um, you know, when you fill, work out the average. Um, Madam Chair, Council Member, we do the survey. Um, it's a snapshot in time, so we do it the last week of September and the first week of October. And so we, we try to make it uh, a time that really reflects the commuter, the, the, the typical commuter market, not special events. Okay. Any other questions? Not, um, did we? We have one more, we have the last slide here. Mm -hmm. We do have one Let's more finish slide. there. <coughs> um, so just to conclude, um, Oh, we do have some individual facilities in selected corridors that have constrained capacity. The system as a whole has a lot of capacity to support future ridership growth. Um, so the planned expansion of the system is really focused on strategic investments. We are building a 550 space park and ride at 94 and Manning Avenue in Lake Elmo that will be constructed later this year and is planned to open in December. This will help alleviate the limited capacity in the I-94 East corridor. MPTA is also planning to expand Apple Valley Transit Center by 330 spaces in 2019, and that facility is also uh, near capacity. And then the, the two LRT extension projects will be adding over 4,000 new parking spaces, and together all of these projects will be adding additional 5,000 parking spaces to the regional system. We're also working on um, uh, an annual survey for next year. We do this survey every year, but every other year we have collect license plate data. And we use that to um, determine um, the distribution of, of user, users' home origins. 
And that's really useful for us to understand what the, the market area is for various park and rides. And then um, working with Metropolitan Transportation Services, the council is updating the regional park and ride demand forecasting model. And that work is underway, should be completed later this year. And that is expected to um, update uh, population employment forecast, as well as taking into account some other factors that we, we know influences park and ride demand. And then just to, to touch on um, I-35W construction, we, we know that there's a big construction project coming and that there will be increased demand um, at some of these park and rides in the 35W and possibly Cedar Avenue corridor um, next year and, and in the coming years. And that, that concludes my report. Um, the, there is a report, it's available online on the website. Thank you. Thank you. Nice. Okay. Thank you very much. Our last uh, information item is the uh, 2017 ridership report. Rick? Am I okay? Mr. Harper, welcome to the committee. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, <coughs> committee members. I'm John Harper, the manager of contracted services here today to present to you the 2017 year end ridership. This uh, report that I give to you quarterly has been uh, adjusted a little bit for this presentation to include the Met Council service for the year to date or the 2017 annual. We will then talk about the regional services as well, the regional partners, uh, suburban transit providers, and then we'll talk specifically about quarter number four and uh, the impacts that <clears throat> their increase may have had on ridership. So, I missed this it's on so this slide, first slide in the presentation shows the uh, trend line of ridership and uh, the ridership for the year was down just less than 1% uh, from just over 87 million to just a little over 86 million rides for the year. This slide shows a breakdown of the ridership by, by service, or what you might call mode. And as we talk about every presentation, the workhorse of our system is the local ridership. The uh, <coughs> rail ridership, uh, so the local is in blue, the rail ridership in yellow, is uh, about uh, about 25 percent of our service and uh, express ridership is the third largest wedge there in red and then the other services that we provide uh, are varying small pieces uh, of the of the total so this slide here shows the totals for 2017 compared to the totals for 2016. And uh, want to just raise, on a, raise a couple items here, uh, and that is to, to say to you that the BRT increase of 71%, uh, this is the last quarter when we will have um, BRT for, uh, BRT started in the middle of 2016, so this will be the last slide where we'll we will compare a partial year of BRT to a full year of BRT. And um, you know, so that's, that's what's really showing that 71%. Uh, we will talk about a couple of the other items. Well, I'll, I'll touch on, on North Star as well. Uh, there will be a conclusion slide later, but I'll touch on the North Star ridership here. It is up 12%, and uh, so that, that is a good thing. Um, and uh, you can see the others here. So the system ridership. Hello? Yes. And there's a question, Mr. Harper. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank John, I have a question about this slide. Do you have a sense if we just looked at, uh, say, July through the end of the year, uh, if we tried to compare apples to apples 2016 to 2017, how steep is that increase uh, year over year? Uh, Madam Chair and uh, committee member, there is a slide later on that will oh, okay. talk about fourth quarter specifically. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe that will answer your question. Okay. Thank you. So this 
is the shows the system ridership trend. So this is not just the council service, but includes all the other uh, suburban provider service in the region as well. And as you can see, this graph uh, mirrors the graph of the council service and uh, the council and the Metro Transit, frankly, uh, is the vast majority of the service in the region. So as goes Metro Transit, so goes the ridership trend for the most part. And you can see that reflected here. Uh, once again, this shows the, the varying services. So local in blue, rail in yellow, and express in red. And that trend or, or those percentages mirror the council service provision. Madam Chair. Council Member um Can you, if we look at local bus um, reductions, um, which we saw, like, do you remember when those started, when we started to see a reduction, how many years ago? Is it just the last couple or is it more than that? I, Mr. Harper? I'm just curious how many years Ma ago Madam we've Chair seen and that trend. Member Dorfman, I don't remember. It has been quite some time that local ridership in particular has been, has been uh, level or falling. Oh. I don't know how long that has okay. been okay. in particular. Maybe others yep. in the room. Madam, Madam Chair, if I may, uh, I know Mr. Petrie tracks those numbers very carefully, so maybe we could mm -hmm. invite Ed to the table here to respond to that question more specifically. Welcome to the com committee, Mr. Petrie. Good afternoon, Chair, committee members. Yeah, local ridership is one of the riderships that we have been watching. It's been trending down about, about the last two to two and a half years. <laughs> two and a half, okay. Yep. And was level before that or had it it had pretty well leveled off leveled. but then it started to go down down about two and a half years ago so with some of the additional analysis that we're doing is we're you know we're looking at looking at by, by route looking at by time of day and also looking at the impacts of the fare increase or I determine if there's any pockets or any specific yeah specific I was, I was curious about the fare right. um, yeah. the fare increase and that impact and then I think some of the reason which we've thought all along is just a reduction in gas prices Madam Chair, committee members, that is one of the things too. That's we've also contacted a number of the other transit agencies, and actually contacted APTA, which is American Public Transit yeah. Association, and across the nation, ridership is down due to the due to the low fuel. Okay, thanks, mm -hmm. Councilmember Elkins. Um, I'll stay. Uh, yeah, you, you okay. hold, hold on, on me. You, you, you may stay. Uh, <laughs> I will stay. And, uh, help with the, <laughs> Make yourself okay. comfortable okay. there. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I think that we're seeing increasing evidence uh, from uh, cities around the country where they've been able to collect uh, uh, data from uh, transportation uh, network companies that uh, there is evidence in places like Boston and New York where they're collecting that data that uh, um, Uber and Lyft and the like are having an impact as well, um, especially uh, during off-peak hours. And so I, the question I would have for, for you guys is uh, are you seeing seeing a particular drop in, in off-peak ridership, like e evening evening and weekend ridership? Uh, Chair, community members, I don't have the information right off the top of my head, but I believe we are, but I can get back to you on that. <laughs> All right. Any other questions with the expert panel we have here? <laughs> I think you should just stay, just in and case. I'm sure I, I believe you're being generous <laughs> with saying that. So. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is the system ridership uh, broken out by the, the various modes, um, and you know, and once again, this this reflects, you know, primarily the the trends at Metro Transit and the council sees. But just to to point out that the total ridership in 2016 was just more than 96 million rides. In 2017, the total is uh, just about 95.5 million rides, uh, and that is all providers all services. Okay, and this slide shows you the regional providers shown independently. So uh, each of our suburban partners and uh, the trend that uh, they are undergoing. I want to point out Southwest Transit. About a year ago, we pointed out Southwest Transit and uh, they did the Ryder Cup service out in Chaska and um, had a, about a 100,000 ride bump in their ridership. And this the decrease for Southwest Transit is the reversing of that 
bump. So without the Ryder Cup uh, included, they are seeing uh, just a very small change in their, in their service. Uh, I think just a slight increase if I read my slide correctly here. Okay, so quarter number four. So this is uh, the service uh, statistics, uh, serv the ridership uh, 2016 compared to 2017 for quarter number four, which is the, the uh, post fair increase ridership. I want to point out a couple of things which are on the conclusion slide next, um, and then we can talk more if you want to, and uh, Ed and I can answer questions as, uh, as we can. But I uh, want to point out uh, that the Transit Link service, if you recall, we doubled the fare. Uh, Transit Link was uh, tied to the fixed route fare prior to the fare increase, and we m increased it to tie uh, to the Metro Mobility fare. So for those Transit Link riders, we essentially doubled their fare. And uh, you can see that the ridership is down. We are struggling also in the Transit Link uh, area to find enough drivers to fill the service. And we are able to deny rides on Transit Link. That's different than Metro Mobility. And so we are struggling to uh, find enough drivers to fill out the, the shifts, provide all the rides that our customers would like if we um, if we had their drivers. So you see that there. Uh, Vanpool uh, is a small program. It goes up and down. Uh, it is not, it did not have a fare change. So this number is just the, the program going up or down. Uh, independent of that. Um, the Metro Mobility, I want to point out that uh, Metro Mobility is up, but Metro Mobility is up less than we thought it would be when we projected the 2017 uh, ridership. I, I do want to also point out that uh, just over the last couple uh, weeks, we had the largest Metro Mobility Day in program history. Yep. And, and Nick, if you remember the numbers, Director Thompson, you can maybe help us with those. Madam Chair, members, yes. On uh, Valentine's Day slash the first warm day in a while slash the first day of Lent, we had 9,300 Metro Mobility riders, which was a 1,000 more than we'd ever had in a single day. So the last year's trend of a 1% overall growth last year, May, we were watching closely because ridership appears to have rebounded strongly, not just that one day, but was up, I believe, 9% in January, too. So ridership is definitely uh, something to watch on Metro Mobility. So I'll go to the, if, if I may, just to, to finish out, and we can go back to questions, if I may, just to finish on some of the conclusions here, and that that is the fare increase, uh, we've talked about it a little bit here, has had a negative impact on, on the modes. Um, we aren't certain what that impact is, and we can talk more about that because of the number of um, past programs we have and the number of things that impact the ridership, uh, we are continuing to, to monitor that. We talked about the, the A-Line BRT and the, its impact on the BRT ridership. I want to mention that rail ridership is up, North Star is up 12%, and the light rail uh, services are up 4%, and we mentioned uh, Metro Mobility's increase. So with that, uh, I'll, we'll take more questions. Okay, Council Member Elkins. Yeah, I just I think uh, are we I think we're also seeing some evidence that metro mobility ridership may also be being impacted by the transportation network companies as well. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, members, yes, we well at least anecdotally we're hearing evidence that uh, some of the rides are shifting to that. Mm -hmm. um, we there's services linking up with that. Uh, and so we don't we have no quantitative, but I, it would not surprise us at all based on what we've been hearing from customers that they are shifting some trips uh, when they can and if they can afford it to TNCs. Councilmember Commerce, did you get your question answered? I did, Madam Chair. Thank you. I did not preview the info items as I did business items. So thank you, John. Okay. <laughs> Councilmember Dorfman, can you remind me? Um, here too. Um, we anticipated that the fare increases would result in a downturn in ridership and that it would take a certain amount of time to catch up. What was that catch up 
Uh, Madam Chair, committee members, when we originally had forecasted for the fare increase, we anticipated that we would have between about four and a half and five percent ridership loss, mm -hmm. and it would take about 24 months to recover okay. that, that ridership loss. Okay, thanks. Okay. You have a question? Thanks, Madam Chair. Council Member um, McCarthy. In regards to the express buses, I know last year um, we, we um, closed some of the services, um, a few routes. We ended a few routes. Um, I think it was middle of the year. I'm not quite sure. I don't quite remember when. But was that the closure of those, was that a substan you know, substantial number to, that would affect the reduction of this ridership? Madam Chair, committee members, I don't have the answer to that, but I can find that out. I imagine it was nominal because express um, services were, um, the number of riders were, um, was being reduced to begin with. That's why we closed some of those routes. Okay, but Madam Chair and committee members, I believe you're talking about we had done in 27, or we, we did in 2017 some harvest and on reinvesting of some service. And when we were doing those types of routes, those were routes that had very low productivity, very low ridership. We were cutting those out to save some of the dollars for our budget deficit. Mm -hmm. but would it, they would have had minimal ridership. Minimal. Okay. okay. Any other questions from committee members? If not, thank you very much. Thank you. And I was mistaken, uh, members. I went on to my second page of the agenda, and we do have one more information item. Yep. Yeah. The 2018 Transportation Committee Work Plan, and we've got Mr. Furman and Mr. Thompson. Walk us through that. How would you like to proceed? You can stay here, or is it? What would you feel comfortable doing? Well, this is pretty quick. So. Yeah, Madam Chair, this is a point where we uh, bring it as a draft and uh, give you some highlights from the two from Metro Transit and MTS of what planning this year, and take your input if there's any other work items you'd like us to add or focus on that are not on here. We would then add them and bring them up as a final at the next meeting. So we I, we can each walk through and highlight a few points uh, that are on here if you'd like. Um, I know from MTS, if you look at um, the MTS page, uh, there's a couple things I would highlight is that um, in, in addition to the routine work with that we do, we'll be adding uh, the METMO task force follow-up item that's new this year. This is the year we finished the TPP. So last year there was a lot of work items around the TPP. And so this year uh, items around finishing up and having that adopted is a key. We begin our travel behavior inventory. Uh, connected in autonomous vehicles, we haven't talked about that yet much today. So I thought I'd talk about that. We will be, we're gathering information to hold a <coughs> policymaker workshop this year, which we would invite all of the council members and some of the tab members to to kind of level the where we're at with autonomous vehicles outside of our TPP processes um, and bring in some experts <clears throat> on that. So that's what we'll be working on. And then we're doing a lot of work around what should the MPO do around autonomous vehicles? Not autonomous vehicles is everything, uh, technology and everything, and really trying to focus it down on what are the things we should be working on as an MPO. And so that'll be part of that workshop on autonomous vehicles. We start two studies this year the system to system interchange, which we just went through tonight. Congestion management, uh, we're hiring some consultants to complete that, which is our federal requirement. Um, transit ways, uh, we're, we're kind of to be determined, but this year, uh, Rush Line and Riverview, in addition to Gold Line, all have activity. Uh, MTS is starting to reduce our role in that, and Metro Transit, obviously, is so taking over more roles in that. Um, so those are a few keys. So lastly, I guess on the very last page, this is the year we solicit for regional uh, regional solicitation so uh, stakeholders can put in projects. So that's every other year, and it, that is application for that will begin in May through June, and then throughout the rest of the year we're evaluating and scoring and leading to a conclusion of selecting the projects through that in the following January. So that's just a few highlights. I'd, before turning it over to Mark, I'd take any comments on anything MTS about what you see missing or any questions you'd have on the work plan. Question. Council Member Elkin. Yeah, thank you, Mark. I only see one fair policy update, and that's in May. Um, it is, I know Nick was looking at hiring a consultant by about 
Well, by now, probably. He escaped on us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know if Mark, if you have any... I forget the current schedule for that, but it was hiring a process. Uh, yes, I do not know the current status of that. But that's something we can reflect in the final draft. Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Commerce. I wanted just to um, kind of draw out the comment that Councilmember Elkins made earlier about the impact of ride sharing. Um, this is a topic that really extends between um, MTS and Metro Transit. Obviously, we have kind of a, re a regional leadership role on the MTS side, but this is really, I think, could very much be a fundamental business management issue on the Metro Transit side. Um, the article describing the Boston experience and some limited study work there really, I think, conveyed that this could be a, a, a very substantial influence in what our transit operation looks like in 10 years. Um, so I'd love to be able to spend some time on that issue, thinking about what is the, the business strategy part of that, um, that issue in addition to as a regional planning priority. Okay. I'd like to make that suggestion. And Madam Chair, Council Member Cummers, I, uh, I think we all know that MnDOT was sponsoring that uh, demo still sponsoring out their test site in Monticello, but also for Super Bowl. And then I was at the Hennepin County Board meeting last Thursday for some Southwest actions, and they also approved a demonstration in April on the Midtown Greenway corridor for an autonomous vehicle. So it would be interesting to invite MnDOT and the county back to give us some kind of debrief on what they have been finding with those tests. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, I agree, and I, I wonder, I don't mean to intentionally merge things, but the ride sharing and the autonomous vehicle piece yeah. are kind of converging in a way right. that, yes. y you know, I, are, I think typically viewed as two separate things, but for our operations work, they're like the same, right? Um, yeah, and I, I think that, that some of those things that we're starting to see now that, uh, you know, other regional agencies are getting their hands on the ride-sharing data. It's, it's foreshadowing things that uh, will, you know, only be accelerated when we have uh, autonomous electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Madam Chair, I, I was kind of hoping under these sections where it said Southwest LRT update that for the coming year it could say positive update. <laughs> <laughs> I'm optimistic. You take good notes on that. Mm -hmm. I'll defer to Mark, I'm sure. We'll yeah, he's oh, well, his tongue. <laughs> Madam Chair, on the Metro Transit calendar here, uh, we've got a number of active projects, uh, starting certainly Council Member Dorfman with Southwest, uh, as well as Botno. Uh, I chose not to put them on time specific because the timing of each of those activities is somewhat more fluid than maybe others of them that are in an earlier planning stage that we control more. So uh, we will bring those at the appropriate time and based on our meetings earlier today, we'll be bringing a set of Southwest actions here uh, in March for the committee's consideration. Uh, but you also will see uh, C line construction updates, D line, you'll see first introduction of an E line update later in the year. Uh, gold line will begin to bring uh, quarterly updates to the committee. Orange line, we hope to be uh, doing construction there at Lake Street Station uh, before 2018 is out. So uh, a lot of those actions from a project perspective you'll see. Uh, but I will also say that uh, there's uh, light rail vehicle uh, maintenance program. Uh, our initial vehicles for the blue line now are at midlife. So uh, we've talked to the committee before about some investments that we need to be making on those. And so we'll bring that program before you. Uh, depending on what happens with the legislative outcome with the bonding bill, uh, we hope to be able to secure not only the full funding for the uh, the D-Line project, but also for the sixth bus 
garage and maintenance facility for Metro Transit. And so once we know that outcome with clarity, uh, we'll be bringing that back to you likely in the summer. Madam Chair. Uh, Council Member Connors. Mark, thanks for the, uh, the outline. I had a question about um, your arterial BRT kind of longer term outlook. Um, as you said, I hadn't seen, this was the first experience that I'd seen anything about E-Line. Yes. And I just wondered, are we going off of the prioritization of corridors from that 2011-12 arterial corridors transit way um, uh, study in terms of what will the F line be? What will the G line be? It would be helpful, I think, to have some conversation about what's the continuity of all of these lines together. I know we've seen maps, et cetera. We've made some decisions about that. But in terms of prioritizing how yes. we deploy those, that would be helpful. Uh, Madam Chair and Council Member Commerce, uh, yes. And that's still kind of our rubric for moving forward. Uh, and I thought I saw it here on September 10th. Uh, Katie Roth is tentatively planning to bring a, a bigger picture update. But uh, what I hear from you is each time we're going to be talking about a D line or an E line or an F line, we should provide the committee with the context of, OK, so here's our overall rapid bus program. And how do these fit into that? I think is important context as the committee is uh, getting up updated on each of those lines. I think that's helpful. I agree. I, I agree. And I think, too, there there is a there's a, a kind of embedded policy decision in there that I feel yes. like we're not totally engaging in terms of which corridors should be prioritized. And, and we need to make findings <laughs> about how those are consistent with Thrive and our other policy documents. Right. So I think we need to be more involved in, in that discussion. I have to admit, in my mind, those lines are getting a little blurry. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'd like to just see another map. Just refresh sure. me again. And, they, they have a variety, of, they're in a variety of different stages. They Some have funding, some don't, and yeah. providing a picture of that would be, yes. would be helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, yes. I have a question um, that you'll probably know. Um, when it comes to the end of a governor's term, mm -hmm. um, what's the transition like here? Is it... Um, I think we need some staff people to help us. <laughs> We've <laughs> experience. done at, at some final date or... Yeah. Uh, I think it's a, there's a carryover is it, into the next... Is there a carryover until appointments are made? Or, yeah, that yeah, was... Yeah, yep. a good uh, question. Uh, what is your experience? Uh, Madam Chair, Council Members, when we had the 50th Met Council uh, celebration a month ago, uh, it occurred to me that my tenure here at Metropolitan Council now is for the last half of those 50. I've been here 25 years in 2018. So, uh, yeah, that was my same reaction as, wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Uh, so I will share with you just past experience and assuming that something similar would play out again uh, with the new administration is, uh, yes, there is some carryover. Uh, your tenure will continue on into early 2019. Uh, the past history has been pretty much Q1, uh, probably should be your mindset with that uh, because the new administration has to get mobilized and then uh, the council will call out for nominations, applications for council members and then that's uh, under current law, which may alter depending on outcomes of this 2018 session, but uh, currently and historically that then uh, goes to the nomination committee who then very uh, thoroughly interviews those candidates. You've been through the drill, mm -hmm. and uh, the last she one. was. <laughs> well, that's last true. Yeah. Yes, but <laughs> most but of you really have been up through. To how quickly the governor puts that. Has whoever the governor, next governor is puts that in place. Mobilizes that and then uh, gets through that process and uh, you know ultimately makes his or her determination on uh, who those seventeen members will be. Okay. Typically, the chairperson is uh, identified first and yes. uh, nominated, if you will, because it still requires Senate confirmation. And then the 16 district 
uh, council member positions uh, will lag behind that a little bit further into the springtime. So do you remember, Mark, when Sue was appointed, Sue Haig was appointed by the governor, um, and then she very much participated in that um, right. nomination process. Which, did she begin serving as the chair right away with the old council? You know, I don't, re I don't recall. Uh, Madam Chair and Council Member Dorfman, uh, my recollection now, not quite eight years, seven years ago, is that uh, there was a little bit of awkward transition there. Uh, Chair Bell finished his tenure pretty much at the end of calendar 2010. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, new Chair Hay came in. I don't know if it was in the first meeting of the new year in 2011, but uh, there was a little bit of transition there, and I do recall one or two meetings where new Chair Haig was kind of going through, a, I'll call it a routine council agenda, mm -hmm. no big policy decisions, but procurement actions or whatever that the council had in the pipeline until the new council could be seated uh, on both sides of Chair Haig. Yeah, okay, thanks. Any other questions? Well, no further business to come before the transportation committee. I'll call the committee adjourned.